So where are those people at home? <laughs> I, I have two things to tell you. The first, actually, Pastor Jamie Houghton told you. He, this is his words. He said that the people here tonight are true Coloradans, which would mean, therefore, <laughs> if I'm just interpreting you correctly, So, look, I'm, it's not necessarily me saying that, although it kind of is, but it's not. I'm just interpreting what the pastor of the church said. <laughs> That's the first message for you. And the second one is that while it's good if, you know, if you live up a, a dirt track and the snow makes it difficult for you to get here, tomorrow you can't have lunch with us via Facebook Live. So, right, that's true, right? We haven't figured out a way to make that possible yet. So my hope is that you'll be able to make it tomorrow. It'll be a good day. It actually will be a really good day tomorrow. Because what have we got coming up tomorrow? Um, we're studying two, two subjects. The first one is the mystery of death. I tell you what, I mentioned this uh, the other night when we talked about judgment. I love taking the subjects that are very important and relate to all of us but are typically misunderstood. I like to demystify them. And we're going to do that tomorrow morning with our subject, the mystery of death. If I were to tell you that this is the subject, maybe, Bob, what do you think? Do you think it is perhaps the most misunderstood subject? I mean, there's probably no more misunderstood subject, right? Sure. So I don't know if it's really the most, but it seems like it. And, uh, and, and another subject that goes right along with it, and that's the subject of a hellfire. And I know that when you say, ooh, we're going to be talking about hellfire. It's not that easy to make that sound really engaging and as though, ooh, I can't, I can't miss that. I must be on the front row. <laughs> but it'll be a fantastic subject. I tell you what, it's a great subject. I'm not going to tell you it's not serious business. I'm not going to tell you that it's not, you know, there's, an, there's an element of solemnity about it. But we're going to take this subject that is really, really important, but really, really misunderstood. Uh, perhaps not by you, maybe by you, I don't know. But by the time we're done tomorrow, we will have cleared up a lot of misunderstandings in a lot of people's minds. We will have set a lot of minds and hearts at ease. And tomorrow's subjects, which go together really, they absolutely go together, uh, they are the subjects that will, will, when you understand them right, can cause you or help you to look at God altogether differently. That's true. So, I'm looking forward to those then. Looking forward to tonight's subject as well. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Thanks for joining us wherever you are. Uh, it may well be that my... Is my tie straight? <laughs> it might be that my wife is watching. And, that, you know, my life, you know, my life, my, li my life just falls apart without her, you know. And she can tell that my tie is crooked and my hair wasn't done. Because when she's around... I, uh, I make an extra effort to, to look a little more presentable. So, see how, see how well I've done? I really tried hard tonight. And that'll be actually because somebody else told me to make sure my tie was straight. But, it, but whatever it takes. Okay, then, thanks for being here. Let's pray. Uh, and we'll ask God to bless us as we open the Bible tonight. Heavenly Father, we are glad to be here tonight. We're so thankful. We're thankful that high above the circle of the earth, there is a God who is love. We are grateful that you look upon us with, with kindness, with favor, with grace, with purpose. You have chosen us all to be saved. Now, it's up to us, of course, whether to accept that gift or not. Tonight, we want you to open our hearts towards you. We want to learn more. We want to learn more about how we can live closer with you and in harmony with you. So bless us. I pray that we'll have a focus tonight, that you give us willing, willing hearts, open ears, listening ears. And I pray, too, that we'd see Jesus. So give us your grace to that end. I pray uh, that we do more than see words on a page, but that our hearts and your heart would be united. We thank you for blessing us tonight, and we pray in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen and amen. <clears throat> Now, maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you cannot. I was raised 
knowing actually very little about my family. Now, I'm the youngest of seven kids, and uh, I knew my siblings, and I knew mum and dad, but outside that, we had a bunch of uncles and aunties who weren't really uncles and aunties. Uh, they were somehow connected. Maybe some of them were friends of the family, but some of them were... Both of my, both of my parents were, were fostered. They were foster children. Neither of them were adopted, oddly enough, but they were both foster kids. So we grew up with these uncles and aunts who weren't really blood relatives, and we, we grew up with a certain, I, I don't want, this wasn't, this wasn't anything traumatizing, I don't mean that, but we grew up with absolutely no idea of where we came from, other than mum and dad. What was beyond our parents, no idea, and from a country like New Zealand, which is basically uh, I mean, in the last couple of hundred years, it's, it's an immigrant country. There is a native people, a Polynesian people. But if you're not Polynesian, then you, then you came there late. And so you came from somewhere else. We didn't know anything about that. Nothing. So that was just an interesting thing. I remember once traveling to Ireland because I'd heard that my, my father's mother, and we had her name, was born in Ireland. And I went there to do some, some searching in the records that they keep there at a place called Joyce House. At least it was a Joyce House in Dublin. And so I got parents' names, and then this one's names, and that one's names. But other than that, we just were at a dead end. We had no, no, no real clue. Until three of my brothers were together. I have four brothers. Three of them were, three of them were together, and, and they were discussing this. And one of them came up with this bright idea. They said, why don't we do a search on the Internet? We'd never thought of that before. So we had some names of, you know, we, we'd managed to go back up the line a little bit. All we had was names. And so they, they, they put in, they typed in on my mother's side the, uh, the furthest back name that, that, that we had. And our good friend Google had all this research done on my mother. And we found out that there was a family on Prince Edward Island in Canada. Uh, a lady there had done all kinds of research, and she's my cousin of some kind, I suppose, and I plan to actually meet her later this year. So that was fun. We found relatives on my mother's side of the family. And, that, and I don't know why. The truth is we were slightly more interested in dad's side of the family because that's where the mystery was. That's where the mystery was. So it was good. We, we had names and so forth, but no real relatives. We did manage to meet a cousin of my mother's, and that was neat. But the guy said, what about, what about dad's side? They had a name. The internet came up with nothing. And then they said, why don't we try Facebook? Which I know is the internet, but the rest of the internet had nothing. So they tried Facebook, found somebody, called that person. Can you please uh, give us some information? The guy said, I'll give you a phone number. So my brother called that number. Now, my dad's name is John. He, he was named after me. My dad's name was John. <laughs> And so, so my brother called, called this woman Margaret. He called Margaret on the phone. And they wait. The heartbeat quickens. The other guys are waiting. What's going on? What's going on? A kind voice answers the phone. Hello? He said, hello, is that Margaret so-and-so? Yes, it is. He said, hi, this is Greg Bradshaw, my brother. This is Gregory Bradshaw here. And it seems that we could be related. And she said, yes. So my brother said, does the name John Bradshaw mean anything to you? And then there was a, a little silence. And then she said, he's my brother. And we'd found Auntie Margaret, my actual, real, bona fide aunt that I never even knew that I had. And then Auntie Margaret showed us pictures of her brother. She has a brother who was, I mean, could have been my twin brother. The photo of my uncle, I don't know what, forget, uh, he passed away, so we never did meet him. The, the photo of my uncle when he was five years old, and my photo, you could have just put them on top of each other to be the same person. It was phenomenal. We finally discovered family that we never knew we had. And so I met a cousin of mine in, in, a, in, a, in a wine bar in New York City. That's enough details. At a wine bar in New York City. And I met another cousin in, in Topeka, Kansas. And I have a cousin in Michigan that I haven't met yet and I'm going to meet. And 
uh, fun. We met a lot of family, and it was it was interesting. But for for reasons, I mean, I, a psychologist could probably tell you. But once we found family, and not that we're in our new family's pockets, we life pretty well just goes on like it did before. But we were just a little more settled because we understood a little bit more about who we were and where we came from. Where we come from is important to us, and it's important to God. Origins. You remember the, remember the TV miniseries Roots, which came out, I think, in, in the, wasn't it the 1970s, based on the novel by Alex Haley? And so we were introduced to characters like Chicken George and Fanta and Kunta Kinte. It was a fabulous program. It was, it was this whole idea of somebody exploring and discovering their roots. There's just something about doing that. You know, down in the end of time, the question of origins is going to be a really important question again. Because God, down in the last days of Earth's history, is calling the human family back to discover its roots. And so speaking of origins, how did we get here anyway? Well, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Now, when you get to the book of Revelation, you find a bit of a tension there, a tension in the book of Revelation, a conflict over the question of creation and creatorship. And so we read in Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 4, where the Bible says, so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? And then you read in verse 8, which says, all who dwell upon the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so there, the question of worship and the world, it says the whole world wandered after or followed after this beast, the creature, not the creator. But when you get one chapter over into Revelation chapter 14, there is an interesting call made in light of the conflict in the preceding chapter. Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse 7. Then I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Now notice this. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. In Revelation chapter 13, the world is worshiping the wrong entity, the wrong power. In Revelation 14, the next page over, there is a call to worship Christ, a call to worship the Creator, the everlasting gospel in which the final gospel message to the world, in which God's last words, as we call them, in which the world is called to worship God, a message for the whole world to remind humanity of its origins. There is a conflict in Revelation about who to worship. And that is really significant. Now we must remember the Bible teaches us that the creator of all the world is Jesus. You read that in John 1 starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. Then it says all things were made by him. Christ was the active agent at creation. I'm not saying the Father had nothing to do with it. I'm not saying the Spirit had nothing to do with it. But the Bible makes clear that the active agent at creation was Jesus himself. So we've lost, haven't we, this idea of the Creator. We have. About an hour from where I live is a little town of Dayton, Tennessee. And uh, early last century, one of the most famous trials of all of history was held at the Dayton County Courthouse what became known as the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, a high school biology teacher uh, was put on trial. He was tried for the crime of teaching evolution in public schools. In fact, the man was convicted too. He lost the case and evolution, the teaching of evolution, remained a crime in Tennessee up until uh, the 1960s, really relatively recently. Might have even been slightly later, but I think it's the 1960s. How do we get to this place where suddenly, instead of the default understanding being that God created the world, 
there is a large, I mean, massive amount of people who believe that God did not create, but that in the beginning, well, there was a big bang. And I don't want to speak in a way that is perceived to be disparaging to people who disagree with me on this, because I know a lot of very, very smart people uh, believe that there was no special creation. There was no intelligent design. Many people believe that God did not create the world. And how did we get here? In 1831, an English ship, the Beagle, made an, an epic journey to the Galapagos Islands, which are about 500 or so miles west of Ecuador. And there was a young scientist on board the Beagle. His name was Charles Darwin. As he studied many of the animals on the Galapagos Islands, he found there was variety among the same species. And so this led Darwin to promote a very different idea of creation. He was not the first person to promote the idea of evolution. Charles Darwin was not the first. But he did popularize the idea that human beings evolved from lower life forms over millions of years. And Darwin really was the one who promoted the idea of natural selection. This idea really made God unnecessary. Think about that. If God did not create, we got here all on our own. If that part of the Bible story is not true, maybe none of it can be believed. And so over the years, Darwin's idea managed to rule an all-powerful creator pretty much out of the picture. Darwin proposed the idea that if I traced my family tree back far enough, I would be in for some real surprises. In fact, my family photo might look something like this. That's me and my son. Oh, you can decide who the other person is in the photo right there. <laughs> but God has an answer to the questions posed by evolution. In his final message, these answers are found. And they're found in the book of Revelation. We hear in the Bible a clarion call to worship God as the creator. A call that is not made to one people group or another. But a call that goes out to the entire world. To everybody living in the world. God says, hey, this question of origins is important. And so let's think about this. The heart of the final conflict found in the book of Revelation deals with the question of true and false worship. Worshiping the Creator is at the center of it all. In order to find out how to worship the Creator, keep in mind, down at the close of time, according to what we read plainly in the Bible, is an enormous issue that divides humanity. It's the issue of worship. Remember, in heaven, long ago, Satan said in his heart, I want to be like the Most High. He wanted to receive the worship that belonged only to God. He came down to the earth and quickly got the human family on his side. God said, not so quick. Jesus stepped in and said, I will die so they might live. When Jesus himself was in the wilderness, the enemy came to him and he said, I will give you it all. If only you will, what? Worship me. He has not stopped. He still wants the worship of the world. And in the final days of this earth's history, you'll have two groups of people. The one, the greater, the larger group, people who worship the beast is what the Bible calls it. We can boil that down simply to say for the purpose here, worship the creature. But God then calls to the world and says, no, no, worship the creator. And people will respond to that. They are already. How do we do that? How do we worship the creator? In order to find out, we go back to the beginning. This intricate world, as you know, was created in six days. And on the first day of creation, God said, let there be, let there be light. And just like that, there was light. For five extra days, God added to the beauty of the world, preparing the place for what he would ultimately do on day six of creation, the creation of the human family. First Adam and then his wife Eve. It was God who said, let us make man in our image. We were designed. We are not the result of natural random processes. I mean, imagine. A friend of mine told me about how when he was studying geology in a South African university, 
On the first day of class, his geology professor stood before the class and he said, in the beginning there was nothing, just tiny specks of dust. And then, boom, they exploded and this universe came into being. And then he turned back to the class and he said, don't you ever ask me where those specks of dust came from. You've got to ask yourself some questions about this. God said, let us make man in our image. You were made by a God of love. You were made purposely because you're special. Or perhaps it means the fact that you were made by God gives proof that you are special. We are unique. We are loved by God. We are important to God. Creation, the Bible says... By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. But even though Adam and Eve had been created, everything from light all the way on down to the animals and the birds and the fish and then the human family, God was not yet done. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2, And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. And so God, by instituting the seventh day, gave to the human family a memorial of creation. I've created, now I'm resting and I'm giving this to you as a memorial of my power to create and to recreate. And then verse 3 says, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. And so after the creation, the six days of creation, on the seventh day, God gave the seventh day Sabbath. It was to be an eternal sign. It was to be a forever, perpetual reminder of our roots. A reminder that we were made by God, made in His image, made for an eternal purpose. God made the seventh, the seventh day, and He set it aside, and He blessed that day. He sanctified it. It was intended that the seventh day Sabbath would be a reminder for eternity of who God is and who he made us to be. As a matter of fact, the only reason we have a seven-day week is because of creation. Now, a year, 365 days, and I think six hours and about 11 minutes, that's how long it takes the earth to get around the sun. And a month, that's how long it takes the, the what? The moon to get around the earth. So why do we have a seven-day week? Only because in the beginning, God created. It's the only reason. It has nothing to do with the moon, the sun, the stars, the earth, except for the fact that God made them all. And the Sabbath is a forever reminder of that fact. There are three things that God did on the Sabbath, apart from making the day. He blessed it. That's one thing he did. And then he sanctified it. And then he rested upon it, demonstrating it was different from every other day that God made. Very different and very blessed. An eternal sign of God's powerful creation and of his infinite love. Uh, down there at Mount Sinai, God wrote the commandments on stone with his own finger. The intent being that the commandments would never pass away and that they would endure forever. And when it came to this one about the seventh day, God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? Holy. He said, six days you shall labor and do all your work. Ezekiel, writing in Ezekiel, I believe chapter 49, referred to the six working days. God said, six days, you, six days you labor and do your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. God said, in it you shall do no work. No, not you, nor your sons, nor your daughters, not your male servant or your female servant, not your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. I want you to notice something. The Bible said this is the 
Sabbath of the Lord your God. And that's significant because there are people who will tell you, oh, the Sabbath, that's good. But that's for Jews. It's certainly not for Christians. That's for Jewish people. I would like you to think and just work this through in your mind. So how many commandments did God give at Sinai? There were how many? Ten. Okay. And so if the fourth commandment was for the Jews, what would we then be saying about the other nine commandments? You'd have to say that, wouldn't you? You'd have to. Unless, of course, there's a verse in the Bible that says, oh, everybody, that one, that's just for the Jews. But it doesn't say that at all. So, so this one being for the Jews, it would mean they're all for the Jews. What about thou shalt not kill? Is, it, is that just a Jewish principle? Honor thy father and thy mother. Is that just for Jews? Don't bow down to graven images. Don't covet. Tell the truth. Don't commit adultery. Keep the Sabbath. Of course, they're not just for Jewish people. Of course not. If I was to run the risk of being slightly unkind, of course, I'd never even run that risk. But if I were to, I would say that Christians, when they don't want to do something, blame Jews. Christians who don't want to tithe, what do they say? Oh, that's a Jewish thing. When you look at some of the health principles in the Bible, Christians are the first ones to say, oh, no, no, don't worry about those. That was just for the Jewish people. And then it comes to the seventh-day Sabbath, same deal. Many people will tell you, oh, I, I, I know it's in the Bible and everything, but that was really just for the Jews, which uh, isn't really very responsible thinking. It isn't biblical, and the Bible doesn't say that. It says the Sabbath day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Why? Here's why. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. <clears throat> Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. And then God said, oh, I must tell you this. The idea that the Sabbath was just for the Jews is intriguing. The Sabbath was given at, do you remember? Creation. When did the Jews come along? Not for about 2,300 years. There were no Jews in the Garden of Eden. There were no Jews for the first two millennia of this earth's history. The Sabbath certainly was not made just for Jewish people. Speaking of Ezekiel, he said in uh, chapter 20 and verse 12 of the book that bears his name, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths, God speaking, to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Sanctifies? What does that word sanctify mean? It means, essentially means to make holy, to set apart for a holy use. What in the world is God saying? The Sabbath is the sign that God makes you holy. What did David say in Psalm 51? <clears throat> did he pray and say in this great psalm of repentance, evolve in me a clean heart? Did he say that? What did he say? Create in me a clean heart. Because when you have a sinful heart, you need to receive not a modified heart, not a renovated heart. You need a new heart. That's why God said in Ezekiel again, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. So who alone can give you a new heart? Who can create in you a clean heart and renew a right spirit in you? The creator. Only the creator. If God didn't specially create and you needed a new heart, then you could just wait for time to do its thing. That's not how the world came into existence, and it's not the way the plan of salvation works. God, the creator, creates in you a new heart. Not God, the psychologist. Not your psychiatrist. Not the power of positive thinking. How do I get a new heart? Only one way. From God. What in the world gives God the right to think that he can give me a new heart. He can because he created me in the beginning and he is able to recreate me. And the Sabbath is a sign of God's power to create and to recreate. That's what it is. Can you say amen? It's a sign. 
It's a sign that God has power to recreate us in his own image. And then we wonder about this. Well, this sounds all very Old Testament. John, you've done well. You've been in Genesis so far and Exodus and Ezekiel. Whoa, we're reversing the church and we're going back a couple of thousand years, are we? Oh, no, we're not. What about Jesus? How did Jesus relate to this? Well, in Luke 4, 16, you read, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Remember, Jesus was the creator. He made the Sabbath. And all those thousands of years later, when he came to the earth, he observed the Sabbath, the sign of the power of God to create and recreate. Jesus kept the Sabbath. And we might ask ourselves, well, which day is that? Because if you were to ask around, you get a bunch of different answers. You'd have people say, well, Sunday is the Sabbath. And then you'd have people who say, well, Saturday is the Sabbath. And then uh, a Muslim would say, well, uh, we recognize Friday as the holy day. And someone's going to say, it doesn't even matter. And someone else will say, you ought to keep them all holy. So what does the Bible say? We want to really get to the heart of this. We'll go to uh, Luke chapter 23. And it speaks about what was happening around the time of the death and the burial of Jesus. It says, starting in verse 52, this man, and this man was Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation, or the preparation day, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned to prepare spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Jesus died on the preparation day, and then the next day was the day on which they rested, and that was the Sabbath. And then chapter 24 and verse 1 says, Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So now we've got it. Take a look at this. Jesus died on the, this is really going well. Jesus died on the preparation day. And we would call that today good what? Friday. And the next day was the Sabbath day. And then the next day was the day he rose. And that's the day we call Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday. So it's very clear that if Jesus died on Friday and rose on Sunday, and if the day in the middle was the Sabbath, that means that the Sabbath day would be the day that we today call what day? Saturday. Saturday, that's right. If you look in a dictionary, the dictionary will tell you Sunday, first day of the week, Saturday, Seventh day of the week. The dictionary will tell you that. You could look at uh, you could look at languages around the world. Espanol, sabado. Italian, sabato. Polish, sobota. Russian, much the same. Uh, languages where the word for Saturday is simply the word Sabbath. And then, if you were to ask astronomers and scientists, people who track the movements of the stars, so forth. They will tell you that the weekly cycle, the weekly seven-day cycle, has never, ever been interrupted. So that the day we call the seventh day today, you can be certain that's the day that was the seventh day when Jesus lived on the earth and even further back than that. You could find out by checking the calendar. Now, I know that some modern newfangled calendars have gone and changed things up in the last 5, 10, 15 years. But most calendars will still tell you that the seventh day of the week is Saturday. And so when we begin to talk about the Sabbath, what we know we're talking about to identify the day, that's the day after Friday and before Sunday. That is Saturday. The seventh day of the week is Saturday. On the first Sabbath ever, God rested from his work of creation. On that Easter Sabbath, if you don't mind me calling it that, that's when Jesus rested following his work of redemption. 
God wrote them on two tables of stone. Is it important to God? Sure it is. That's why these are called customarily the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. These were given by God. He wanted us to keep them written in stone, written on our heart, the Bible says. The Sabbath is a memorial, a memorial of creation, just like the 4th of July is a memorial of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Just like your wedding anniversary is a memorial of the day on which you were married. Now, can you change a memorial? Oh, not really. But let's say this. You could if you wanted to. You could celebrate the 4th of July on the 3rd of July. You could have a celebration on the 5th of July. No one would stop you, I suppose. But that doesn't change the fact that the 4th of July is actually on the 4th of July. So we can't change the Sabbath. If we did, we might be changing our practice, but it isn't possible to change what God instituted 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden. Jesus himself kept the Sabbath day holy. Did it change after he died? Well, consider what Jesus' followers did, and you will see that Jesus' followers, each and every one of them, it's all through the book of Acts, kept the seventh day Sabbath holy. That was their practice. It's interesting, you know, I've heard people say, well, the New Testament doesn't talk about the seventh-day Sabbath. You know, I I know how honest you'll be. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say keep nine commandments. He, He surely meant all of them. And if you wanted the verse to think about, you could think about Matthew chapter 24 and verse 19. Jesus was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he said, he said, pray that your flight be not in the winter and neither on the Sabbath day. Now, he said that before his death in 31 AD. Looking forward to 70 AD, when Jerusalem was destroyed, he said, pray that it's not in the winter, and it wasn't. Pray that it's not on the Sabbath day. He was looking 40 years into the future. And he was saying, the Sabbath day will still be important 40 years into the future. No question, God made it abundantly clear that the seventh-day Sabbath would be kept, should be kept, decades after Jesus' death on the cross, and therefore, all the time until Jesus returned to this earth. But didn't the law change when Jesus died? Wasn't the law done away with when Jesus died? Yes and no. It depends on what law you're talking about. Come on, man. Jesus died on the cross. The day before Jesus died, thou shalt not kill was in effect. Jesus dies, and then the next day, it doesn't matter anymore to kill somebody? (laughs) <laughs> That's just not logical. We, we shouldn't even have to go there in our thinking. But certainly something changed when Jesus died on the cross. You remember we talked about this last night. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn in two, remember? And this was God's way of showing the people no more animal sacrifices. It's not a, you just don't have to do that now. They're obsolete. The sacrificial system, the sacrifices of the animals, the feast day system, Passover and Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Tabernacles and so on, no longer was it essential, no longer was it commanded by God that people would keep those things because the ceremonial law, the animal sacrifices, the annual feast days, gone. But thou shalt not steal, absolutely not gone. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness, Absolutely, those commandments are still in effect. And I am glad. I'm glad those commandments still hold because otherwise we'd have wholesale anarchy in the world. It's bad enough how it is. I'm glad God didn't do away with the Sabbath day. And you ought to be as well. Imagine the blessing of God saying to you, you've got a day off once a week, every week for the rest of your life. No matter what's going on around you, no matter what the demands are on you, 
you get at least one day in seven off. This is the commandment of God. And he gave that to us for some really good reasons. Before I talk about them, let me ask you this. When should the Sabbath be kept? Is it from midnight on Friday night to midnight on Saturday night? Or what? Well, if you look into the Bible, you will discover that the Bible says that we are to keep the Sabbath from sundown until sundown. In fact, the words used are from even unto even, evening to evening. And the Bible makes clear that even is sunset. So from sunset to sunset, we keep the seven-day Sabbath. I believe today in Franktown, uh, the, the sunset at 5.43 p.m., my guess is next week, it'll be two, three minutes later, and so on, until in the middle of summer. How, how late does Sabbath come in on Fridays in, in Colorado, around here? 8.30? Oh, not bad. I was up in Alaska where, you know, it wasn't, wasn't getting dark till 11.30. It's still 24 hours of Sabbath, right? Because then on Friday night, it's whatever it was, 11, 11.30. Saturday night, the same. So you've got a, 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 an interesting thing there. So you know that throughout the year, it might be a little earlier in the winter, might be a little later in the summer, but it's still a 24-hour period, and God says, I'm giving this to you as a blessing. Throughout eternity, we'll be blessed by God with this special time. The Bible says, listen to this, Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah chapter 66. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And God says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, that means from month to month, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. We ought, to get used to it. we ought to get used to it here on the earth because the Bible makes clear we'll be keeping the Sabbath forever throughout eternity. The Bible referenced the new earth, the new earth. All throughout eternity, the Sabbath will be kept. Now, we don't want to just know that the God has given it to us. It helps if we understand why. Now we know as a memorial of creation, and that's true. I want to tell you how thankful I am that God has not changed the Sabbath. I'm really thankful. I know not everybody used to do this, but uh, once upon a time, when I wore a younger man's clothes, I'd get out of bed on Sunday morning, run down to church, and uh, sit through the church service, and right after communion, run home. My mother would have breakfast ready enough, I suppose, and I'd scarf down my breakfast and run down to the gas station where I worked, and I'd work all day long, all day Sunday. A lot of people do that. Church, and then it's work, 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 or maybe play, play, play. It's not rest, rest, rest. And of course, we're not talking about rest as being slumber or laziness. The Sabbath can be an active day, that's for sure, but it is a day where the focus is off ourselves off our secular round of affairs, and our focus is on God. And we do those things that build our relationship with God. We, we pour ourselves into those things where God is present. We worship on the Sabbath. We may serve on the Sabbath. We get together and get our noses in the Bible on the Sabbath. We enjoy the creation that God has blessed us with on the Sabbath. The Sabbath should not be a boring day. If it's a boring day for you, then you ought to reinvent it refigure it out, refocus. For me, it's, it's by far the, my favorite day of the week. It is a wonderful day of the week. You know what I know? I know that none of my family members are working. I know none of them have responsibilities. We have time for each other. We have time for God. We have time for the people that mean the most to us. We have time. And you know that relationships are built on time. When we're not spending time with each other, relationships sort of... Uh, fray and eventually they crack god gave us the sabbath day among other reasons as a release valve from the pressures of this world it's a day where we can connect with each other in a time that we can connect with god and it is a safeguard you know some people and and, and 
I'm either one or have been one, and many of us, I'm certain, can relate to this. If there were 15 days in the week, we'd work 16. We'd take all God has given us and then more because we've got to work. I understand that. We've got to. We want to. We enjoy it. We want to get ahead. We want to achieve. We want to acquire. And if we're not careful, you know the Bible says in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And for some of us, it's work and, 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 and business and acquisition and having. And that's, you've heard me say, there's nothing wrong with getting ahead and nothing wrong with working and nothing wrong with making money until you're like the rich young ruler and your goods become your gods. And God says, oh no, I want better for you than that. Take some time out. Make sure there's balance in your life. Regroup. Don't let this busy life push you so hard that you overdo it. Take a deep breath. Step back, rest a little, live. The Sabbath is quality time. It's time with God, time for worship, time with family, quality time uninterrupted by regular work and secular concerns. I'm glad that I can say that can wait. We'll either get it done before the Sabbath or after the Sabbath, not on the Sabbath. That's like taking a, uh, a, a beautiful window and cracking it like that. You're taking that beautiful thing God gave you, and when you, when you trample on it, and as a matter of fact, God said through the prophet Isaiah, don't trample on my Sabbath. Take your foot off my holy day. It helps us to get life in balance. Now listen, of course, we should worship God every day. You want to take time for God every day, time for your family every day, if that's at all possible. Of course you should. But God says, here's a whole day. You can take this day, it's special. You can take this day and really connect. You can take this day and step back from the world as it presses in upon you. Think about what this says about God. Who was it who made God's people work, 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 work? It was the Egyptians. They said, gather your own straw. They were making bricks without straw. That's not God's way to press you to overload, to press you to breaking point. God says, hey, I want to invest in your life and I want to enhance your life. Now think about that. This isn't God cracking the whip and saying, give me more. This is God saying, oh, just chill. Let me give you more. Let me really build up your life. Fascinating too. You know we have this, uh, this circadian rhythm that we live by. That's that 24-hour rhythm that our bodies seem to be so in tune with. There's also something called a circuseptin rhythm built into our bodies. Our bodies, if you examine this, actually operate on a seven-day cycle. Lots of systems in the body are guided and governed by a seven-day circuseptin rhythm. It's how we are made. And uh, when you realize that God hardwired us this way, the gift of the Sabbath just makes a lot of sense. God wants to bless your life with more of his presence. He says, he is the Sabbath. You can receive more of me this way. He wants us to be happier than we've ever been. Stress is overloading the world and overloading people. And in recent years, we are starting to learn more and more about how deadly stress actually is. God says, I got a release valve for you. And on the Sabbath, what's your focus? Are you spending all day long watching the stock ticker to see how, well, thank God the stock market isn't operating on the Sabbath. But if it was, would you be spending your whole day watching them little things go by on the bottom of the screen? What would that do for your special time with God? Would you say, oh, it's the Sabbath. Hallelujah. I can cut the grass today. And then dig the garden and then weed the flower beds. That wouldn't be resting. That wouldn't be communing with God. That would be secular stuff. Not bad stuff. But the temptation would be to say, this is my day. I'll use it on my terms rather than saying, hold up. This is God's day. And I will enjoy it on God's terms. God wants the best for us. The Sabbath is a gift. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man. 
If Jesus was speaking in 2019, he would have said, the Sabbath was made for people everywhere, made for the whole human family. It's a gift. Did you ever go to the store on uh, the day after Christmas? We call it Boxing Day where I'm from. December 26th, did you ever go to one of these big stores, Target or someplace? And to the service desk, there's a line of people a mile long. And what are they doing? They're returning gifts. Why are they returning stuff? Because Auntie Ethel gave this poor fellow something that he just does not want. And he's saying, I'm turning this in. And I'm either getting the money or I'm switching it for something else. God bless you, Auntie Ethel. Don't mean to hurt your feelings. I do not like this thing. And that's why most people are at the return desk, at the customer service desk on December the 26th. Because somebody gave them a gift and they said, nah. So what are you going to do? You're going to turn up at God's customer service desk and say, hey, that was very, that was nice. It's so considerate of you, but I don't want it. I want to give it back. I want to swap the Sabbath for Sunday. Or I'll swap it for Tuesday. Or I'll swap it for every day. I'll swap it for no day. Whew. How ungrateful would you be to turn up at God's customer service desk and say, thanks for the gift, but I don't want it. It may even be that you don't see the great beauty in this. It may be. You may say, oh, I don't care about those circus septon rhythms. I don't care about that. You may say, ah, oh, I'm... I'm, I, I derive great pleasure from weeding the garden. Weed eating, trimming edges. It's therapeutic. God wants me to have therapy on the Sabbath. You may say that. I've had people say that. But I love work. I understand that. But this was God's idea. God understands better than we do. I mean, he just does. And it's so plainly spelled out in the Bible. And this is God saying, time, good time, stress-free time, beautiful time, time with me, time with church, time with people, time with family. And if we know God, even just a little bit, then we would say, hey, thank you, God. You want to bless my life. You want to pour into me. Now, I understand because I've heard people say, oh, I keep every day holy. Well, you don't. I, I, you know. I know what you mean, but you don't. To begin with, on the seventh-day Sabbath, God says, don't do your regular secular work. So how's that working out for you if you're keeping every day holy? And how can you keep something holy that's not holy? How many days did God make holy? So is it possible to keep Tuesday holy? No, no, because it's not holy. Is it possible to keep Thursday holy? Not possible because it's not holy. Now, if I gave you a cold pizza and I said, keep this warm, <laughs> that'd be one thing if I said, make this warm. You go, oh, fine. I put that in the oven or in the microwave and 30 seconds later, it's warm. But you can't keep something warm that's cold. You can't keep something holy that's not holy. You just can't do it. And you can't take Tuesday and holy it up. It can't be done. Only God can make something holy. And he did. That was the seventh day Sabbath. What a good idea. Now, I tell you what. I do not want you to be thinking that I'm saying the fourth commandment is more important than all the others. Oh, it's not. Don't let anyone try to buffalo you into thinking that it is. The fourth commandment is not more important than the other commandments. But it's not less important either. And if you think thou shalt not commit adultery is a good idea, if you think thou shalt not steal is a good idea, then you ought to elevate the seventh-day Sabbath to be on the same level as those other nine commandments and respect that one and reverence that one. Remember, it was Jesus who said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And you know what I think? I would tell you this is what I know, but I'm not sure if I know it or if I think it. So I'll err on the side of safety. I do not believe that Jesus was saying, prove you love me by keeping my commandments. 
He wasn't saying that. Jesus was saying, you know something? This is what's going to happen. If you love me, then keeping the commandments is going to be the pattern of your life. If you love me, you are not going to want to steal. You may be tempted, but you won't want to. If you love me, you are going to want to treat your parents with respect because I am living my life in you and this will be the natural outworking of my presence in you. If you love me, you won't bow down and worship graven images. You see, when love for Jesus is your motivator, you are not starting to ask questions about, ooh, what about this? And how is this going to negatively affect me? And, and what will people think? You're simply saying, did you say, God, that this is your will? I'm in. Really? That's what you want from my life? Hallelujah. That's what I want from my life as well. I remember the first time I discovered that the seventh day was the Sabbath. I said, well, there it is. It's clear. And I had to adopt it into my life. I just had to. Otherwise, I would have been choosing to spend the rest of my life wandering through this world saying, you know, I'm going to tell you that I love God, but watch my life and you'll see evidence that I don't. Because I know what he has asked me to do and I've told God I'm not going to do it. That is not love. So when you hear the voice of God and Jesus calling you to a life of obedience, then you say, if that's your will, then that's what I'm going to do. You get stubborn folks, though. I've met a lot of them. I was probably, I was definitely one of them at one time, and people who know me well may say I'm still one, but there were stubborn people who will say, but this is what I've always done. Why would I change? My parents did this. My grandparents did this. Their parents and their grandparents did this. I'm not going to change. Now, that would be a mistake. Unless, of course, you still use a washing machine with a ringer on it. <laughs> you still have a telephone with a curly cord attached to the wall. Some people do, I suppose. Unless you still ride a horse everywhere you go and you stubbornly refuse to have indoor plumbing. You've changed a bunch in your life already. And some of it was inconvenient. But you knew this was a better way. And when God comes into your life and he says, hey, I've got something for you. It's a gift. I gave it at creation. You might not have known about it, but this will enhance your life. We'll be closer than ever before. Here it is. That's when you say, you know, this might be new to me, but I think I can learn to change. Why? Because God loves me. When you look to Jesus, you see him dying on the cross. And he's there dying for a sinful world because he loves this sinful world. Jesus died to bear the burden of our sins. Jesus wants us saved. He wants you in heaven where you'll keep the Sabbath throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. And today, the Sabbath day is an eternal sign. It's about quality time with God and with each other. It's always a good idea to follow Jesus' example, always. When you do, you're blessed, better off, and never worse off. I want to tell you about a man in Italy in 1975. He was coming home from work. He worked uh, in Turin uh, for the Fiat Automobile Company. Worked on an assembly line. On his way home from work, he stopped at the police station where the police were having an auction. And they were auctioning items that had been found on city trains. And you know how auctions work. They sell them to the highest bidder. Well... When he was looking around the things that were being auctioned, he saw two little paintings, and he said, these would look nice above our dining table in the kitchen. I think my wife would like them. And so he thought, I'll bid on these paintings. And he did, and the bidding just went crazy because another man thought that he wanted them as well. And so our friend ended up paying for these two little paintings, the princely sum of around about 35 U.S. dollars. And he took them home, and he showed his wife, and she said, very nice. And they put them on the wall in the kitchen, just above the dining room table, and our dear man could look up there and say, oh, those are nice pictures. He'd eat his cornflakes in the morning, and he'd see the pictures that he bought at a police auction for $35 for the pair of them. 
after he retired, his son, who was attending university, began to, to take an art appreciation class. You know where this is going, don't you? He said one day, Dad, where'd you get those pictures? Bought them at the auction, son, told you a thousand times. Where were they? Left on a train. Which train? Train that ran between Turin and Paris. Why do you ask? Because one of those paintings looks very familiar to me. They'd been studying a French painter, Pierre Bonnard. He said, that one of those two, Dad, looks like a Bonnard. just looks like the same style. And he started to look through his books in his art appreciation class. And he discovered that it was an original Bonnard. What about the other one? The other one was an, an original by Paul Gauguin. And so they did some investigating and discovered that this man had two paintings by master artists on the kitchen wall of his humble little home, and they'd been hanging there for 20 or 30 years. He paid, how much did I tell you paid? $35. They sold at auction for around 40 million. 40 million. Which means that as this guy ate his oatmeal or his cornflakes in the morning and his spaghetti in the evening, hanging just inches above his head was $40 million worth of paintings. Which, if they'd been stolen, he would have shrugged and he said, oh, they just cost me 35 bucks. He had something. They weren't priceless, obviously. We would call them priceless, worth a lot of money. But the price was 40 million. He had something really valuable hanging on his wall. And he never understood the value of it. The fact that he didn't understand the value does not mean they weren't valuable. He didn't have to understand it for it to be so. But right on his wall, two pictures worth $40 million, and he never even knew. They were unappreciated. He didn't understand the value of what he really had. I think it's a lot like that with the Sabbath. It's right there in the Bible. And unfortunately, a lot of people just don't really appreciate the true value of what they really have. Just a day. Just one in seven. This day? Eh, this day. Without realizing this is a special gift by God. Created. God didn't have to create it. He created on six days. I mean, everything was done. But when it was done, God said, time out. Quality time. This is what our relationship is going to look like. We are going to spend time together because I am making time for you. Of course, God is there for us every day. But the Sabbath is different. It's special. It's been blessed and sanctified and hallowed by God and given to us as a special gift designed to enhance our experience with him forever. No, we may not realize the true value of it. But now we're starting to see. We're starting to learn. Jesus says, do you love me? We say, yes. He says, good. If you love me, then you're going to keep my commandments. And as we keep the Sabbath now, we begin to understand what it's going to be like to come together before the throne of God throughout all of eternity. On the Sabbath. I'm not sure who's going to preach the Sabbath message. I think Jesus Maybe the Apostle Paul will teach the lesson. I don't know. And think of the beauty of nature that we will have to explore every Sabbath throughout eternity. And we'll have family, friends who right now we don't know. And it will be the most special day of our forever lives. I wonder tonight if you are willing to say, Jesus, I thank you for the gifts that you've given to me. And don't forget that the same Jesus who gave you the Sabbath gives you everlasting life. It's this Jesus who died on the cross, nails in his hands and feet, 
a crown of thorns on his head, a spear in his side. Why? Because he is determined that you be saved and that you not be crushed under the weight of sin and that throughout eternity you have joy and peace, peace day to day and peace forever. God is a God who gives good gifts. I wonder if we can thank him for his gifts tonight. Would you pray with me? Let's pray now. Our Father in heaven, I wonder if we really understand the value of the gift that we have in Jesus. You have done so much for us. The wages of sin is death. But you intervened. Jesus said, I will take that so they can take the life that I deserve. And now eternal life is ours through faith in Jesus. We thank you that you wish to enhance our life in so many ways. One of those ways being the seventh day Sabbath. We are grateful. Now we may understand that well or less well. But I wonder tonight, friend, we've, each night we've made a decision of some kind for Jesus. I wonder if tonight you'd be willing to say to the Lord, I accept the gift of salvation in Jesus. And I accept the gift of the Sabbath. I wonder if you can say that. If you can, would you raise your hand right where you are? I'm not asking you to have every question answered. I'm not asking you to have everything cleared up and explained. But are you willing tonight to say, Lord, I'm willing to press on and, and learn more. I thank you for Jesus. I want to claim that gift and the gift of the Sabbath, which you have given to enhance my relationship with you and to settle this question of worship down in the close of time. Lord, keep us faithful, we pray. Come into our lives again and do in us what we cannot do for ourselves. We thank you and love you. We seek your blessing. Keep us by your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen and amen. So we started the week off on the first day of the week on Sunday. We went through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and today is what day? Friday. And where did the sun go just a few hours ago? It went down, which means that we are entering into the Sabbath day right now, and we have the opportunity to worship our God on the Sabbath day, which has already started here in Franktown, Colorado. We are in good company as we begin to honor God's Sabbath today because the likes of Adam and Eve kept the seventh day Sabbath. David, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Peter, Paul, all kept the Sabbath just like we are honoring the Sabbath this evening starting off Friday night at sundown until Saturday night sundown. That is some pretty good company, isn't it? And so I want to wish each of you a happy Sabbath as we enter into God's rest today on Friday evening. And we get to keep this Sabbath just like everyone in the Bible did from Friday evening until Saturday evening. Tomorrow, what time are we going to be meeting here? 11.15. If you want to get a good seat, maybe 11 o'clock. Um, we're expecting a full house tomorrow. Again, please stay and join us for lunch tomorrow. We would love that and we'll have our... Our last meeting, um, it's hard to believe we're almost done this week, um, but we'll have our last meeting at about 1.45. For those of you that are joining on Facebook, it'll be sure and log in around 1.45, and between 1.45 and 2 o'clock, we'll get started with our last one. And let me, let me just say this as well. The next two topics that Pastor John mentioned are going to possibly be some of the most interesting topics you've ever studied in the Bible. These are some of my favorite topics to study because it gives so much clarity on what have been such cloudy subjects for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And so you will not want to miss tomorrow 11:15 and then 145. These last two topics are going to be fantastic. Maybe even the best of the whole series. I don't know. That might be a big that might be a big statement because it's been really good so far, but these last two I guarantee you're going to find fascinating as we dive deep into the Bible to find answers on some big questions in life. As usual, we have some refreshments. I want to say a big thank you to the crew who's been providing these refreshments each night. Haven't those been great? 
it's provided a nice opportunity for us to mingle and to get to know each other a little bit more out in the foyer. So a big thank you to that whole crew that's back there. Um, enjoy the refreshments, and we will see you tomorrow morning at 11.15. Please drive safe for those of you that are here live. It's snowing. Those of you who are at home on your couch, enjoy it. You don't have a long drive home in the snow. For those of you here, please drive safe. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless, and good evening.